Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to another episode of Couple of Nukes. As always, I'm your host, Mr. Whiskey, and I'm wearing my hoodie today because it is a cold spell here. I don't know about where my guest is. I'll ask him in a few minutes here, but wow, it went from 70 and sunny to suddenly like 30s, 20s, and I, I was freezing. Kind of look more of a bandit vibe, but I, I like the hoodie. I had to tuck the strings away. I, oof, custom merch is great, but the, the strings were like this thick. They blocked the whole thing, so... But yeah, I'm here with a man who was an MVP by birth from the womb, maybe well before he was even conceived. It was planned by God, by his parents, that he would be an MVP, Mr. Mike Van Pelt. And no coincidence that he was named that because he is an author, a podcaster, entrepreneur, a speaker, all kinds of things. And we're going to get into that. So Mike, first off, is it cold by you? Well, Mr. Whiskey, thank you for having me on the show. You know, yeah. when you reached out to me, I'm like, the guy's got Mr. Whiskey. How the heck do I not go on this guy's show? <laughs> I am I just outside. Of, yeah, I, I'm just outside of Atlanta, Georgia. And uh, I just walked my dog. I just put a vest on. My my watch says it's uh, 53 degrees right now. But spring is right around the corner here in the it south. Is. It is. And I'm thrilled I, about that, by the way. I do not like cold temperatures anyway. I grew up in the Midwest. And uh, do not like winter. <laughs> yeah, I don't know why we're remote. We're neighbors, actually. I'm I'm in Savannah, Georgia. So so you know that the cold spell I'm talking about is hitting you the same way, probably. Yeah, and, it's it's uh, the weather in the last few weeks has been, been a little. Yeah, yeah, it's uh, yeah. it's weird. But I to me, though, yeah. yeah, I'd rather be where you are uh, because it's 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 close. You, you to don't. <laughs> no, you don't. Because let me tell you, let me tell you, Mike. <laughs> Everyone here, the tourists and locals alike, got spring fever, cabin fever. I'm yeah. telling you, it was like 40 or 50 <laughs> out, but they saw the sunlight, could not drive downtown at all. I mean, Pat, and I don't want to talk about driving when, if you're by Atlanta, <laughs> I mean, I've seen, I've seen yeah, the traffic yeah, yeah, footage yeah, yeah. of Atlanta. Yeah. I know it's a yeah. <laughs> four or five hour commute from one side of the town to the other. Pretty but. big difference between Savannah and Atlanta as it relates yeah. to uh, driving. But, you yeah. know, I would incur, I, you know, I, Tour, tourism is very important to the state of Georgia. And, you know, if anybody gets it, they're listening to this to get an opportunity. Get out. Get out. Get out. <laughs> he doesn't I, want I am, me to be in yeah, They pay the bills, right? But I, I hate tourism. And I hate, I don't know how it is in Atlanta, but I hate that I have to pay for parking. I First off, I refuse oh. to pay for parking. I walk. All right. I will park for free all the way across the other side of town and walk. I'm not, and I get it. The tourists are paying whatever, but yeah. look, I'm a taxpayer. You're going to have me pay yeah. the taxes yeah. and the yeah. and the parking yeah. fees? Yeah. Come on now. Come on now. Uh, you know, everybody's got to go see what's going on in downtown Savannah. That's just the way it is. And not much. <laughs> not much. Too many too many people. I'll tell you what it is. It's um a bunch of blonde women in pink or dresses or white dresses all yelling. That's That's mostly what the downtown crowd is. Bachelorette party every <laughs> single day. I mean, every time yeah. I go out. And I don't go out too much anymore, but I used to be downtown every night and I four or five bachelorette parties. They're wearing wigs and masks. I don't even know what that's about. I it looks goofy. You got the we they call them the um the woo girls, the the bachelorette parties who get drunk on the the bicycle where you're you know, you're all on the bar. Oh yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. it's like a bicycle bar downtown. And every time they pass someone, they're just like, Woo! Yeah. So we call I, them the woo girls. I'll tell you what. Just do that over and over. I again. uh I've been married to my wife now for, for 27 years and, uh, almost a big 30. Yeah. And so it, it doesn't, uh, I, and my wife and I both are kind of this way, you know, we're like, man, none of the, they didn't, this was not a thing when we got married in the way that it is now. Like you would, you know, yeah. like she went to a party at my parents house or you know on both sides of the family they had a little shower and all that and, and that was at it. the parents house that was it that was it it was just a little shower now it's like a thing like we oh, got to have these, like, party buses strippers yeah, everything yeah yeah it's crazy i you know so you know uh i i don't get it i'm kind of glad it was a nice quiet affair for me to be honest with you <laughs> yeah, I remember uh, I was in the bar one time and and one of the ladies came up to me and it, they gave me like a, a scratch off ticket almost thing. And they're like, scratch it. If 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 you win, we buy you a drink. Uh, if you win, you buy the the bride a drink. I was like, well, she she getting married. Have her mans buy her a drink. I'm not here to buy her a there drink. There you go. 
Yeah, there you go. Got any of the single friends, but yeah, it's funny. I used to tell every time we went out, I used to tell all the ladies, I was like, Well, my buddy over there, he drives a, a Tesla and he bought self driving for 15 grand. You should go talk to him. And they would go be like, Take us for a ride in your Tesla and buy us drinks. I'd be like, Get off of me. <laughs> but yeah, but Mike, we're here to talk about a couple of things. So, you know, you're you're a life coach specifically for for men and men's mental health, yeah. which is a you know, it's interesting. So I did a four part special like six hours total uh, President's Day special where I sat down with two buddies of mine and the one guest, a little slay, he presented a question to me kind of out of nowhere. Um, I was talking, I was sharing a story where my grandfather used to cry every time uh, when our school would put on um, like a concert, we would always sing one of the uh, armed forces songs for each branch. Sure, sure. He had been in the air force in Vietnam and he would cry every time he heard it. And yeah. we got into a discussion about masculinity and, and, and crying. And Little Slay asked me, he said, Mr. Whiskey, how do you define masculinity? And, you know, and then we had conversations about crying and stuff. And, yeah. and so, Mike, as a men's coach, and, mm. you know, my answer was we live in a world where the the topics and, and subjects around men, what men are supposed to be and men's mental health are fluctuating a lot right now. I think there's a, a huge divide between old ideals new ideals and you know i and i said it's out of balance you know there needs to be a balance but mike before <laughs> we begin, i want to ask you how do you define masculinity what it is to be a man and you know the shifts that you've observed and, and working with men what works best you know wow geez how long you got uh so <laughs> right you know masculinity uh i talk about the heart a lot so what I commonly say is I help guys get out of their head and into their heart. Now, okay. most of us as men were not raised to think about our heart where we were. Uh, and this is not a knock on anybody or parents or anything. Right. You know, it's just kind of a whole kind of generational mindset. That, yeah, yeah. That, that's just happened over time. You know, guys, we're fix it people. Right. So if somebody says they have a problem, our default is to say, well, I would do this or I would do that or you need to do it this way. And we try to fix things without asking questions. And that's where we get into trouble. And okay. so, you know, where uh, I think masculinity is about being in touch with your heart. Now, I believe that starts by having a relationship with Christ. Now, Amen. Amen. Here's here's the thing, full disclosure, and I, I write about this, I talk about this all the time. I grew up going to church. Church was not an option. I mean, we're right. going, right? And so, you know, what you get a lot of times when you go to church is, you know, the the or at least what I got out of it was the preacher's in the pulpit. I'm down here. He's saying, yeah. just ask for forgiveness. And I'm like, okay, good. All I got to do is ask for forgiveness. And um, in order to graduate from uh, my catechism course, all I have to do is memorize Bible verses and we're, we're good here, you know? And, and okay, yeah, we're good. That get, Like that, reading without understanding? Yeah. Is that what right, you're getting into? Right, right. And so ultimately what happened to me was I don't, I, I'm a firm believer in in, in God, I have been all my whole life, but I, right. there was no intimacy factor there. There was no intimacy factor there. And there really wasn't an intimacy with Christ until I got involved in men's groups. And it will really happen to me at a retreat. Now, I, I've never been to a, I've never been to a men's retreat. It happened in the spring of 2019. I went to a men's retreat and was surrounded okay. by like 300 dudes, right? And we're all there on the same mission, essentially. We want freedom and we want a life of more and we want our heart right. back. Now, I, I didn't fully understand that at the time. I can say it now, but I didn't understand it. And on a Saturday morning, they played a song by, uh, they played three worship songs and the the leader said, we're going to, I want you to hear these songs as if Jesus Christ is singing them to you. And I'm like, okay, all right. Wow. What do you got? What do you got? And so they, the first song was a Josh Groban song called You Were Loved. And it was in that moment, I almost hit the floor. Um, and, you know, I, I heard God say to me, I want an intimate relationship with you. You're my beloved son. And I, I want to be 
a part of your life, you know, it's beautiful. And I, it was really in that moment where the whole I, I men's life coaching thing began to formulate in my mind and where I began to explore more. What does this intimacy with, with Christ look, look like? And it looks a lot like being very authentic, very real, very vulnerable. And so when you talk about crying, you know, I think that that is a part of that intimacy with God. I mean, I, I remember when I first got involved in some of these men's groups, I would I would look at the leader and I'd be like, I, in particular, a guy that helped mentor myself and my partner who helped me start the podcast uh, originally. And I'd be like, man, there he is crying again because he was hearing these stories, right? And I right. think what happens is, that closeness with God, I mean, we cry because we're happy. We cry because that intimacy with Christ feels so good. It's not out of sorrow so much in the time. It's just being in touch with your emotions. You know, masculinity is love. It can be used for good. But it's when men bury what they're feeling deep in their soul and don't let anybody in. And, and, and don't talk about their wounds or their traumas, most of which in many cases happen when they were young children. Yeah. I mean, that's where, that's yeah. where these things uh, kind of percolate. And, and so, you know, we will bury this stuff in hopes we never have to deal with it. And what happens is you grow up, you get married and you get in relationship and the most intimate relationship you will have outside of Christ is your, is, is your spouse. And, but if you're not right. intimate with them, and I don't mean having sex, that's always a part of it, right? But I mean, if you're right. not intimate with them in terms of being real, being authentic, right. being honest, if you're trying to bury everything, your relationships are are not going to be very good. And it won't just be your wife. It'll fall. It'll, it, your children will fall in line and you won't have great relationships yeah. with your children how do I know this? It's not even speculation. Look at the divorce statistics. We have relationship problems in this country. Yeah, they're they're bad. Um, and, and so what what happens is people take the easy way out and they go, well, this isn't working out. Let's get a divorce. And then they get married again. Now, here's what's crazy. Second divorces fail faster than your first one. And third is even yeah. worse. Makes sense. What's happening there? Well, What's Carry happening? Over. Yeah, what's happening is you Carry haven't over. done the work. And, and typically it sounds something like, man, my first wife, she was a real B. Man, she was off. And you know, and now you've been married two or three times, but it's always the wife's fault. Irony yeah, even, there. Even though there is a common denominator there. <laughs> right. So, so you know, what ultimately needs to happen is, you know, you need to take a look in the mirror and see what's going on in your own life. And so you know, there, there are a lot of ways to describe masculinity and being, being a man, but right. I, I, I really feel like, as I've talked about this a lot, it, it's really about being in touch with you. If you don't love you, you can't love anybody else. It just doesn't work. And so True. that masculinity starts with you doing work on the inside so that you can be good on the outside and, and just be real and authentic. You know, um, when I first got into uh, men's stuff, of course, a lot of it started by reading John Eldridge and looking at John Eldridge stuff. And John would talk right. about wearing a mask and posing. And there's a stupid saying that's out there that I grew up with, which is fake it till you make it. Um, yeah. Yeah. All these things are the great setup for Oh, you can pose and you can get by and not be real. And I know because I did that for a percentage of my life, you know, and uh, you will live a very lonely life <laughs> by not, yeah. by not being, uh, by not being real. So, you know, th those are just a few things that I think about when I think about masculinity and 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 the whole idea of toxic masculinity is a whole other crazy right, right discussion that that people in hollywood think they know something about when they're really the the 
you know, the mm. causing, you know, that there's always going to be bad people yeah. in whatever. There's going to be bad men. There'll be bad. There'll be, a, you know, a small percentage of bad teachers, right. a small percentage or, of bad. Police I mentioned officers. the balance. Yeah. Cause yeah. there's, there's, it's a spectrum, you know, there's going to be toxic masculinity where it is too much, but I also think there's a lot of right. pushes for men to be too feminine for men to just be women, which is different than, you know, be, yeah. being and acting like a woman isn't not being toxically male. It's just totally out of whack, you know, and I, I think it's bad. So if you're a man, is, you're a man. If you're a woman, you're a woman, period. Bottom line, right. that's how Christ created you. There is no other way. Yeah. And, and so, you know, can you be a bad dude? Yeah. If you're running around and hitting your wife, you're a bad dude. That is right. toxic. No doubt about it. Get your stuff together if you're doing that, you know, um, get your anger under control. But um, yeah, I I don't want to go well, too far. You know, now. like here's how I see the spectrum, you know, like I don't think it's feminine for I think it's too feminine for a man, you know, to get fake nails. He's got like, you know, like excess accessory nails like a, a woman would have. But I don't think it's too feminine for a man to enjoy gardening or to write poetry or do stuff like that, which some people consider societally most people consider more feminine you know like artwork and, and gardening you know stuff like that i think that's something that socially people will take a on us. yeah people will take a stereotype and they'll stretch it as far as they can whatever whatever the way that they want right. i mean is is i love you said gardening is gardening feminine well i gotta say adam i have a potato eve, farm in my house so uh <laughs> adam and eve, well adam Adam, first person to walk the earth, um, was tasked with doing one thing, taking care of a garden. Um, yeah. you know, and and so, you know, Eve was created so that Am uh, uh Adam would have a companion and they were tasked with one thing. Uh, other than procreating the earth, they were tasked with taking care of the garden. That's beautiful. I've I've never heard a word like that. Man's first mission was to be a gardener. Uh, that's yeah. beautiful. Well, now yeah. I grew up in central Iowa, so farming is uh, uh, part of my DNA, man. You know, so uh, it, it's... But yeah, but I think it's like if you're growing crops, you're you're fine. But I don't think it's wrong for a man to want to have house plants around the house, you know, to have flowers. In fact, oh. one one of the most powerful men I ever served with in the military. I mean, he's jacked. I mean, his arms are are crazy. He grew. He used to compete competitively in sunflower competitions and and i mean he grew they were almost 20 feet tall he had these massive sunflowers in kansas i mean beautiful but yeah and you know one of the things you said uh that really you know how i would define masculinity as well and, and this is what little slay is said he said um as a giver i think men are a giver like you said you called it a fix it man um but i call it you know a protector and a provider, you know, they all go into that same thing, right? The yeah. reason men want to fix things is because we're the protectors. You know, we've always been the leaders of the household or the community. And, and yeah, and you know, it's our job to look after our, our wife and our children. I'm not saying women can't be independent, but at the end of the day, even independent women, when they're in a marriage, the man is, is taking care of most of this stuff, you know, and, and he should be there for her to fall back on. And so I think, that's part of the issue, though. You're talking about men loving themselves and fixing themselves first. And I feel like a lot of men don't take the time to do that because they no. can't. You know, they are they have this drive to take care of everyone else's problems, to be a leader and protect and, and provide and do this and that and that and that for everyone. And so they're always pushing off themselves. They're like, I'll be fine. I can take care of myself later. And then there is, never is a later. You know, and even like you said, getting married after getting divorced and then getting married after getting divorced again, you just not taking that time to take care of yourself or process what happened because you're like, well, I, I want to get married and I want to have a family. I want to provide. I want to protect. I want to, you know, create a family. And I think that's a big issue with why a lot of men are broken or like you're saying that people are getting you should never get married more than once, let alone three or four times. Anytime I hear more than two marriages, it's like that's an, in insane like slow down like you know i can imagine i i don't even want to do taxes as a single man <laughs> let alone doing taxes like this and that all the paperwork you know so uh there's I mean, stuff that happens right i mean we're yeah. people sometimes there's yeah. personalities there's things that don't work out i i, right. I understand that but 
Yeah, when it's been done two or three times, you know, unless it's a result of a death, um, right. there's there's something going on there. And gotta reevaluate. <laughs> right. And so I'm a I'm a big believer in learning and educating yourself. And the word I really love to use is just being curious. You know, being curious. Uh, if you're curious uh, as a man, you may explore things that you've never explored before, including yourself. Okay. And, uh, it, being curious uh, is something that, to me, was a learned trait. So in my collaborative book, if you're watching this on video, you can see behind me the um, – the uh, collaborative book I did, Cracking the Rich Code, I had an opportunity to write a chapter in that book. And the chapter I chose to write was uh, a question that I'm exploring more and more all the time, the power of asking for help. Because what I found was that in, in my life, at a very young age, uh, I started wearing eyeglasses uh, at the age of seven. And at the time, that was a, a, un unusual uh, to, to, right. to do that. And, you know, n so it wasn't the, the fact that people were calling me four eyes or trying to bully me. That was just kind of part of the situation. But yeah. what happened was I was, all, I was introverted for, for one. And then the other thing that I noticed was that people would observe me wearing glasses and they go, well, you must be pretty smart. Now, if people come to you and they say you're smart, that means you can't ask questions because if you do, you're not going to be perceived in the way that, or at least this was my thinking, right? You can yeah, call no, it I, I agree. if you want. But, but so what happened was I began a life of not asking for help, not asking questions. If I didn't know the answer, I wouldn't right. raise my hand. And so in some areas of my life, I got behind. Now, not asking for help is actually a very uh, masculine trait to carry around. And I'm not saying it's a good one, by the way. You know, I mean, it used to be before we all had GPS on our phones, the only way to get around, you know, a, a young guy like you wouldn't even know this. Uh, we used to actually carry maps. That's what, by the way, that's, right. that's what our glove box was for Mr. Whiskey. I don't know. If <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah. but, you know, and so what, what would happen is you'd go on a trip or whatever and you'd be like, well, I'm lost. I don't know where I am. And your wife would go pull over, you know, go to the gas station and ask somebody. And the last thing a guy's going to do is go, going into that gas station and asking for help, right? We're going to figure this out, you know? Yeah. And, you know, that's not a, that's not necessarily a good way to live. And, you know, so I talk a lot about that there's power in asking for help. And not only is there power in asking for help, that when you make up your mind to do that, it comes from a very curious place. And that's a good place to be in because, you, you right. know, Despite what's going on in the world with our smartphones and social media and all this stuff, I have news for you. <clears throat> you may be one of these people that has a large following on Facebook, but they're not your friends. They're your <laughs> followers. There may be a small percentage of them that are friends and family, but a huge piece of them, or I don't even know half the people on my social media, they're followers. Okay. Real relationships are done belly to belly, face to face, eyeball to eyeball. And the only way you can make those relationships is to take your damn face out of your phone and talk to people. Mike, I got, I got something. Yeah. So <laughs> are you, are you familiar at all with Dax? He's a rapper and he made this song called to be a man. I mean, it's beautiful, but he made another song searching for a reason. And one of the quotes, I, I love this lyric. He said, forget about all of the followers. You know, talking about social media followers. He said, forget about all the followers. Jesus only had 12 disciples. And, and to me, that was such a beautiful quote. I was yeah. like, yeah, Jesus has hundreds of thousands of followers, right? But at the core, at the core, you know, it was that group that really well, dude, followed yeah. him and, and, and spread everything. And that quote hit me so powerfully. Now, I'm, I'm not a big social media guy. I have like... <laughs> 
you know, a teenage girl would look at my numbers and laugh. She'd be like, oh, you're like my dad. You know, he has 10 followers, <laughs> 50 followers. Gee, but, thanks. Yeah. And then <laughs> it's kind of like a balance, too. They're like, well, if you don't have if you don't have at least 100 followers, you you know, that's a red flag. Yeah. But if you have more than 500 or something, it's a red flag. But yeah, I mean, there, there are people out there who have, I mean, that's what matters to them, the, the followers. And, and to me, you know, so if I post something on Instagram, which I rarely do, to me, it's not a question of how many likes I get. I'm seeing who is liking my content, you know, and, and, and the people I have are people I care about. You know, I don't need validation from yeah. strangers. I want to stay in touch with people. Uh, but yeah, I think I'm on, I'm on social media because that's where the wounded are. That's where the hurting. Yeah. And I'm yeah. trying to connect with those people. Yeah. Otherwise, I wouldn't use it. Oh, yeah. I use it for work. But it's like social. I'm very anti social media because I think there's a lot of bad consequences from it. There's also a lot of good of social media. Social media is a tool like anything else. And any tool is yeah. how you use it. Very and unfortunately, so. young children are kind of almost programmed to to use it for 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 bad. You know, they are making themselves self-conscious. They, they are, are, you know, you were talking about being bullied for having glasses. There's people being cyber bullied for everything. I mean, I talked yeah. about this the other day. You post something. I mean, there are pictures of women who are beautiful, beautiful, or men who are, who are very handsome. And you go through the comment section, and there is just such awful hate over the smallest things, nitpicky things, things that don't matter. Um, but one of the things that you said that really resonated with me, uh, because, you know, I've always been perceived as, as pretty smart, too, is the I, I was also embarrassed to ask questions because it would be like, you don't know that. You know, uh, right. and that no right. one ever, I think men and women, like no one ever wants to hear, you don't know that you don't, but you're, you know, you're so, and so you don't know that you're supposed to know that. And I, I think that is something that is still very relevant and, and definitely with glasses. Yeah. It was, especially I've noticed, I mean, glasses have just always been associated with nerds and stuff. And it, it's yeah. funny because right. people with glasses actually read less as children than people without glasses because they couldn't see. You know, it, yeah, it, it's which funny. is funny. Uh, to your point, the um, irony. It always put me in the reading program because uh, I was slow to get out of the gates at the beginning of the school year, and because yeah. I didn't like to read. Now I love sports, and so like my mom would take us down to the library when we were young kids, and she'd say, "Pick up a book," and I'd get, I'd be over in the sports section, right, and I'd be look, and I was just <laughs> looking for the pictures. You know, I, I just yeah. want to read pictures. Um, but, uh, yeah. Yeah. So what are you well, going to do? It's funny. This actually reminds me of Russell Roberts, you know, Captain Russ Roberts. He was on my show. He was an airline pilot and I, I read his book on learning to fly, navigating the turbulence and bliss of growing up in the sky. And, mm. uh, <laughs> that's with the subtitle, you know, just called on yeah. learning to fly, but I love yeah. saying the full thing. He, um, his, his father was like, no, you, you can't get glasses. That's not manly basically. And so Russ yeah. was, he was failing all his classes. He couldn't see the board. Couldn't see. He couldn't take <laughs> notes. He couldn't read. And yeah. you know, finally yeah. his mom like put put her foot down one of the few times in his whole life where she did. And she was like, look, he needs glasses. Um, and then it was, you know, the whole consequence was he wanted to be an airline pilot. And he lived in a time where if you had glasses, you were not allowed. Luckily, they lower yeah. their standards. Just yeah. like everything in the world is lowering their standards. Yeah. But, yeah, it's just funny you said that. Yeah, his father was like, glasses on my kid? No, and his kid couldn't read. It's like, well, and, 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 you know, probably that's the era he grew up in. And, oh, you yeah. know, I, the, so there, when I wrote my chapter on the power of asking for help, I, I said, well, I think there are four reasons, primary reasons why guys don't ask for help. Well, one is, you know, the fear of rejection, right? So if we ask for help, somebody will reject us. What I've, come to realize is that there might be that outlier that rejects you, but most people actually are very willing to help and would love to, to, right. to help. In fact, I encourage men to get around sage guys, you know, guys that are older that, that they want yeah. to uh, pass on that, that information. And right. the other fear that I talk about, like, guys don't ask us this feeling of uncertainty. Like if we take a risk, it has an uncertain result. Well, what's going to happen? Who cares? <laughs> you right. know, I mean, if you don't ask for help, you just fall behind. And then I talk about this a little bit differently, but like this, 
this fear fear of of authenticity like well if i'm real how how are people going to approach that and and the reality is you know you <laughs> People want somebody who's real and authentic and real and authentic comes right. from asking for help. And finally, I, I talk about this feel like, well, we don't ask for help because of this, this idea of, of, um, of being unworthy, um, you know, like, you know, <laughs> and, and we're worthy to ask for help. You know, you're unworthy if you're comparing yourself to others and, 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 and trying to be like every guy on your street. Um, you know, just cause somebody has got six cars sitting in their driveway in a boat doesn't mean that they have this hunky dory life. They have secrets too, by the way. Yeah. And, um, so I, I just, I encourage asking for help. And I commonly say to people, if you're around people who don't appreciate you asking for help, you may want to reevaluate who you're around. Yeah. And, and you know what, my little plug for people who, you know, want to ask for help without asking for help. Uh, what I love about the men I spend time with, first off, as men, we're supposed to help each other and hold each other accountable. And, and the way we ask for help is, you know, sometimes let's say you're embarrassed about your situation or, you know, because of those ideals that you just stated, because, yeah. you know, you're supposed to yeah. know it already, or you, you feel unworthy. Uh, well, well, because I'm part of a religious community, and, and so why I, I encourage this to to, to non-believers and atheists too is I always ask my my buddies because we're all religious. Well, would you please pray for me? I'm going through something, or 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 that's the way we reach out to help. And then sometimes they'll be like, "Well, hey, I'm going through something too. Could you pray for me?" Or we'll elaborate upon it. And I think that's a a beautiful way too. And and going back, uh, I just hadn't wanted to mention you were talking about men crying and and religion and that and. I don't remember his name, but the Slayer, when he was on the President's Day special with me, he mentioned a saint who every time he prayed, he would just wept over the love God had for us and, and stuff. And mm -hmm. I shared with my guests, you know, uh, from Dax's To Be A Man song, he did a mega remix with like 10 other artists. And one of the guys said that Jesus is the only man who's ever made perfection life like he's the he's the perfect man, the only man who's ever been perfect. <laughs> and Jesus cried. And, and so he was expressing that we can too. Jesus is an example of what men are supposed to be like. And, you know, Jesus wept. And I, I shared a story where Jesus wept over people who passed away, who he already knew he was going to bring back. But yeah. he, the re, so people were like, why did Jesus cry if he was going to bring him back? To show us, to show men that it is not masculine to, some men think it's masculine to not cry at a funeral. We have to be an example of we're going to get through this. We're tough, but. I think when a, someone close to you passes away, you know, it is masculine to to cry and express that emotion. I mean, what is worse than, than losing someone important to you? You know, and if you and and yeah. I think it's unhealthy. You're teaching your your kids and the community around you like, hey, it's not OK to grieve. It is. It's not OK to grieve forever. It's not OK to not move on. But there oh, is I, a cycle yet to go through. Yeah. Go ahead, Mike. Our emotions have power both negative and positive. You know, um, what's interesting is, I don't know if you made this connection, but I, so I'm just going to talk about this for a little bit. Okay. So yeah, go ahead. True Man Life Coaching and tr the True Man Podcast, which I do, the, the name True Man came out of my men's small group when we really formalized it and decided that we wanted to name ourselves something. And we were really searching what do we want to call ourselves? And quite honestly, we felt like, you know, another group named men of steel was probably, you know, not, <laughs> not, not so great. And I was really coming through scripture and, you know, just reading about Jesus Christ walk on earth as a true Amen. man. And, you know, we started talking about it and realized that Jesus was the ultimate role model, Right. I mean, we're never going to get to where Jesus was as men, but you should shoot for that. That should be your aiming Agreed. point is to follow him in scripture. He lays out how to live and, and whose you are. Your identity is not tied to your job, what you do, your the amount of money you make, your boat, your what, whatever it is. 
your identity is whose you are in. And that is, that is Jesus Christ. He lays this out. And so we were like, wow, this is pretty powerful. And because I'm not some business genius, I'm like, well, I'm going to name my business true man life coaching and true. And, you know, because I feel like that's the ultimate goal to help guys get to. And so, right. you know, I'm just the tour guide in that as I sometimes refer to myself. Mm. In other words, my job as a life coach, as um, uh, somebody really in anything, not just even a life coach, is to listen and ask powerful questions. Yeah. Because I'm a big believer that we all have the answers to whatever we're after inside of us. Sometimes it's hard to see the forest for the trees and we just need somebody to walk alongside right. us and just kind of talk through things or mentor us or hold our feet to the fire or whatever the case may be, you know? And, um, you know, I have a client right now and he's basically like, dude, I just want you to, the biggest thing I want you to do is, is, is just call me on my bull crap. And Hold each other accountable. You know, yeah. Yeah. And so this is why I'm a huge proponent of men's small group and guys getting together on a weekly basis at the very least, you know, you know, every other week. But right. I mean, you have a group of guys, eight, nine, 10 guys that you can get around and really be intimate with. And I'm talking about, yeah, your conversations may start with, you know, whatever's going on. I mean, you know, you're in the South. So all my Friday morning men's group conversations start with SEC football. And then, and then we go for the, you know, then we go a little yeah. deeper, but yeah. you have to be with a group of guys that is, is, is diligent about talking about things that matter, not just scripture, but, but, you know, your wives, kids, jobs. And I mean, going deep on this stuff, we can, the beautiful thing about men is we're built to be in community. Now, some people will go, well, that's not very masculine. It is. It's actually very masculine. And I think one of the big things that we can do is have a group of men that we can be exposed to and around that are real and authentic and vulnerable right. with each other. And that way we can learn because I'm not great at everything. In fact, as a coach, I drink my own Kool-Aid. I have a faith coach. I've had a podcast coach. I've had a golf coach. I mean, I could go on and on and on. Right. I, I don't even know how many coaches I've had in my lifetime. And the reason yeah. for that is, I don't know everything and I can't do everything on my own. And sometimes I need somebody to keep me accountable. And so I'm a big proponent of having those types of people in your life. I just think it's really, really important. It's, it's, this world is a difficult place and it's not getting any easier. And, no, and, no it know, really isn't. Uh, the, there, there are so many choices. I, I you know, you're, you're a young guy. And I say to my kids all the time, I got two kids in college. You know, I, I'll commonly say to him, man, I am so sorry. I am so sorry for the world you're growing up in. Yeah. You know, um, there's so many choices. There's the, the technology behind things. Um, are, are smartphones great? You know, I could pick up my smartphone right now and look up and go, oh, man, thank God my daughter's on campus. I had a funny feeling like, you know. Right. You know, uh, you know, and I can see where she is, you know, um, some of that's cool. What's not cool. And we talked about this a little bit, you know, the social media stuff, the fake hokey stuff that's going on out there. Yeah. Um, you know, and people, people buy into this, they buy into it. And I, I really don't know why, um, you know, my newsflash for most people is, um, I know people aren't going to believe this, but not everybody's a multimillionaire. Not everybody has a jet sitting in their driveway. Not everybody drives a Lamborghini. Um, in in fact, it's 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 
three percent or less of the population that even has that kind of money. But that's you know that's what your feed is full of, uh, you know. Right, and so you go out to social media and and you have and what's bad as as an adult now I know a lot of adults who still fall for that crap, but our kids do not have the ability to discern uh, a lot of this stuff. In fact, I was just with a guy, a pastor, and he was telling me this story. And this one just blew my mind. So spoiler alert for some of you, because I may tell you something that you don't know. So he was walking down the hall of a church. He'd just given a talk and there were some kids standing in the hallway and the kids are standing there debating on who the best boxer in the world is. And these kids all were in 100% agreement that Rocky Balboa was the greatest boxer who ever lived. Okay, the news flash here is Rocky was a movie, not real. Rocky Balboa is not the greatest boxer that ever lived because he wasn't real. And this yeah. pastor tried to tell these kids this and they would not believe him because they googled it hmm. and so to me that's what's scary right my mom recently said to me um she went to the doctor and she said i i was googling something and that made it worse i'm like duh why would you go do that i mean yeah. you, you think god google is the medical dictionary of course you know um google all the bad stuff comes to the top. Why? Because what the media and all these companies have found out is that fear sells, right? If yeah. you're scared, if you're scared of the diagnosis, what are you going to keep doing? You're going to keep treatment, that treatment, on there too. That. You're going to keep Big searching pharma, yeah. until you find something that works. And so they keep, they know what keeps you online. If you're scared, you're going to find, until you find the antidote, you're going to keep searching on google and the longer they can keep you at there the more information they can gain about you and yeah. so you, you got to be careful about who you're giving power to in this world and that starts with proper discernment you got to be able to think you know or and self-discipline because you're self i mean the feed absolutely. is going to feed you what they think you want right because because you know i They've put, you know, women cosplaying in, in barely any clothing as anime girls. And all you got to do is like one and then they put another one. I get one them all the time. I get them. I get them oh, all yeah. the time. And but here's what here's what if that you is. just get something else, though, because here's the thing. I, I've also started liking, you know, I like scripture verses. And the more of those I like, the more of those populate and other stuff goes away. And social media is really a result of, of what you're choosing to, yeah. to have fed to you, you know, I mean, you, you are in control and then you're always going to get that, you Here's know, the lingering side effect that. and all that, but yeah, yeah, go ahead. Here's it, this is really important guys. So I want you to pay attention to this. Now, as a men's life coach, there is nothing that I put out there that is related to scantily clad women coming to my social media site. Nothing, absolutely nothing. Now, Owen, oh, by the way, if you're a woman and you're listening to this, you should be listening to this because what woman doesn't want their man to be the best man and father and husband they can be. So please Amen. forward my podcast or this podcast on to the man in your life so they can get a reality check, you know, but I get women coming to my social media all the time. And here's how I think of that. That is the evil one trying to take me out. It's a test every time one of those nasty women, and I don't they may not even be real. They may be bots. I don't even Most know. Most of them are the, bots, yeah. yeah. Yeah, AI stuff that's going on nowadays. But you know that I treat that no differently than how I treat my life because C.S. Lewis has a quote, and I screw it up every time. I should have it just right here in front of me, you know, right, like right, basically right. Get it, getting up every day is like starting all over again. In other words, your relationship with Christ is like starting over every day. And as the man of the house, the devil knows if he can take you out, he can take down your family. And so it's up to you. Amen. 
to to have the discipline to know, you know, who's really out there chasing your heart because I God wants your heart, but the devil's working really hard to take you out because he knows what he gets. It's not just you if he takes you out. It's not just you if you make a bad decision and decide to, you know, uh, whatever bad decision you can think of on any right. given day that you can make. Um, the devil knows he can take you out. And half of your battle, or at least what I found half my battle is, is to know that the evil one is part of the equation, that he wants to take me out. And I know that every day is a battle. And I got to armor up, you know, yeah. and, and it's that way. It starts over every morning. You know what we're fighting against? Wicked principalities. Absolutely. 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 Unfortunately, you know, we live in such a rich and by rich meaning money world mm -hmm. that, you know, now we've, you know, we've, um, we fall a victim to our own world of riches. You know, we think we got to compete with the neighbor. I mean, how big's your house? How many cars do you have? What, you know, yeah. do you have a pool? Do you have, and how big is your you cowboy know, hat? Yeah. 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 And, um, you know, I, it, it's, it can be a, a challenge for a man because so many men think they have to compete. And when you have to compete in that way, you're going to, you're going to make bad choices. You're yeah. going to make bad choices. And, and again, I, I would circle that back to, you need to be with men that can, can, can help you and keep you in check. And, and you need to, you need to get right with your Lord and savior because it's just that, that important. Yeah. No, I, I agree. I think, uh, and and I always say this for for all men, whether you're a believer or not, the Bible is a good book full of wisdom <laughs> and stories. Yeah. You know, whether you believe it or not, it is still packed with so much knowledge. And I, I mean, you should believe it. it's real. I mean, I'm just gonna put out there, it is real. I mean, it's proven a thousand times over. But even if you're 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 doubtful or skeptical, it's still a great guide. Uh, you know whether you believe in God or not, it's 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 is a guidebook on on how to live, on, on what you should worry 100%. about. So, hundred percent. You know, one of the greatest self help books ever written. Yeah, by a lot of people, um, they would say, "Think and Grow Rich" is one of the greatest self help books ever written. Well, dive into that book a little deeper and peel back that onion. There's a lot that comes out of there that first yeah. came from the Bible. So. Um, you know, and, and any self help book that's oh, yeah. been written after the Bible was referenced, uh, you know, a yeah. hundred thousand times over. I mean, yeah, people so, quote it, even non believers quote it, and believers quote it. Everyone quotes it. There's there's a lot of sayings that, ah, how about money is the, the root of all evil, or or evil yeah. starts with the desire for money. I mean, money is good. Money is good. Yeah. It's the love of money that mm -hmm. you. Know, Falling in love with money yeah. is what gets you in trouble. You can use yeah. money to do so many wonderful things in this world. But there's I've a got lot of materialistic so many... people in this oh, world. Oh, man. But you we know? exist spiritually, primarily. First and foremost, yeah. we exist spiritually. 100%. Yeah. And, and, sure. and one of the stories, I, I, I love this. I saw this little comic when I was growing up. It was this man was told by an angel, they're like, you're going to die you know, soon, get all your stuff together. You can bring one suitcase with you into heaven with whatever you want in it. So he sells his mansion and his yacht and he sells everything and has it turned into gold bricks. He liquidates all his assets into gold bricks and he brings it to heaven and angel greets him. And he's like, I just got to check your luggage. And he goes, huh, that's weird. And the guy's like, what? You know, he's very proud. He's like, this is, you know, the... This is the summation of all the riches and all my work on, on the earth. They said, uh, we just think it's weird that you brought paving stones to, to heaven. And and he looks and his street is just made out of, of gold bricks. And, you know, it's just, I always liked the message there, you know, it, it because that money has no meaning in heaven. It has no meaning in heaven. It has meaning in here and you should use it wisely here. And like you said, a lot of people want to make bad financial decisions to impress people. 
you know, to post a picture on Instagram or to bring their friends over and be like, look at this, look at this. But that's not what matters. What matters is having food for your, your family and for yourself, you know, to be taken care of. But yeah. So, so I mean, how do discuss... you take care? How do you take care of the people that, um, you right. know, there, there are people out there that, um, you know, they don't have the education or maybe their mental health is not where it needs to be. And they need, you know, and, and they don't have the means to go do anything. How do we take care of those right. people? How, how do we take care of the people that have fallen on hard times? You know, I was recently at the Atlanta Food Bank, which, by the way, is the second largest food bank in the entire country. It's incredible. It's 335,000 yeah. square feet of food. And what they do is they work with church pantries and a lot of this gets sent off to the smaller church pantries. And, but you know, when you go into a facility that is that big wall to wall food and you just stand there and think, hey, it's almost hard to fathom that there are that many people that need help. Now, yeah, you know, so what could you do for good, you know, when you have money? And um, that's to me, you know, why am I doing what I'm doing? Because, right, I, I want to impact the hearts of men. I want to see men. I want to, what happened to me when I was at a low point was, Men rallied around me and, you know, I was able through the help of them, through the help of my relationship with Christ and through my own desire to be successful, you know, I was able to, to, I always say, make a comeback, uh, have that right. redemption, have that second chance. And w one of the reasons why I do what I do is to be there to help men have a place to go to where they can get that second chance. They can, they can take the time to figure out what their purpose is in life and, and begin to move towards their legacy because we all have a legacy. Yeah. The question is, <laughs> how do you want to be remembered? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, you have three options: good, bad, or not remembered at all. Yeah, and and and, and I think I I love yeah. I've always loved this quote from Julius Caesar, the the version written by William Shakespeare, where he said, "The evil man does live after him; the good is often turreted with the bones." And I I think that's such a powerful saying. It's it's a reminder of be careful of how much evil and how much good you do, because evil is always remembered more than good. And so you really want to be balance that out. And and same thing with relationships. You know, if if you're dating someone, you can compliment them a hundred times, but if you insult them once, that's what they're gonna be focusing on. That's what they're gonna think about. You know, and, and I talked about this the other day and just having a positive mindset versus a negative mindset and, and talking about how negativity and, and, and negative self-talk is like a, a we talked about how it's like a record on repeat and it gets worse and worse each time. Because it's it's negativity is going downhill. It's got that momentum. Positivity, trying to build yourself up. It, you, you, there's so much resistance from the negativity of the world and all that. And so when you're making choices, you really need to think about what will the lasting impact be? You know, is the good enough to overcome the evil? And you got to think you can do a couple yeah. of good things. Uh, but it doesn't necessarily erase your It doesn't erase your sin. You know, it doesn't take away the bad and trying to balance it out later on in life. Sometimes you can't, sometimes what you did is just too awful, not in terms of God and his forgiveness and love, but in terms of how people think about you. Well, there's this saying out there that we've all heard, right? You are what you eat. So if you put good yeah. food in, you put good food in your body, um, for the most part, you put good food in your body, yeah. you know, you're, you're going to have good things happen to you. If you sit there and eat, bad stuff all the, all all day long you 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 can have an obesity issue well the same thing applies to your mind if you put good things in your mind you you're going to reap the rewards if you 
put bad things into your mind and an example. And, you know, we've talked about this on the true man podcast several times. Addiction right. is a big thing um, just overall for yeah. people, but in the men's community, you know, um, you know, we have to talk about things like the addiction to, to pornography because it's, it's yeah. so substantial, but if you're putting that into your mind, you know, are you being in light? Probably not, you know, and you know, there's a lot of other negative things that come that way. So whatever you're okay. feeding your mind is, you know, going to be an end result of how you turn out the people that you're around. If they're not, you know, right. if they're takers and they're, they're takerish and they're, they, they, you know, they're taking from your life. Well, I, you know, that's not going to help you. And so you need to get, a, you know, get more around givers. And so um, this is something that I talk about quite a bit uh, uh, as well is, is making sure you're around givers and not takers in life because takers will take and givers will give and the givers, you know, if you give more in your life, you will reap more. And that's biblical right. in nature too. Uh, so, you know, it, it's, it's important to feed your mind well, feed your body well, you know, eat right, exercise, read your Bible, right. all those things, man. That's an important, that's an important way to live your life. It's also how you will lead well, you know? Yeah. Well, ladies and gentlemen, you heard it here. You are what you eat. And my name is Mr. Whiskey. No correlation there, but <laughs> You know, so yeah. Well, there's nothing so, wrong with an occasional whiskey or bourbon. Nothing at all. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Not today. I I still haven't eaten breakfast yet, so I <laughs> oof, I'm running on empty. But yeah, Mike. That all being said, as we wrap things up here, is there any big takeaways you want to leave us with? You know, ladies and gentlemen, links in the description below for the True Man podcast. And I'm gonna after talking to Mike off Mike. Mike off mic. You know, we're going to talk about <laughs> getting those links for all his books, both the collaborations yeah. in his books and all that, but a, a ton of resources for both men and women, as we said, uh, you know, holding your partner accountable as a woman is, is a good thing to do. But don't send this to him and be like, see, this is what you need. This don't don't start a fight. Be supportive. Uh, I right. just want to put that out there because I already know there's a bunch of women who are going to take this 100%. and be like, see, yeah. you're the issue. Mr. Whiskey said, you're the issue. Don't, hey, don't put this on me. Don't put this on me. Put it on Mike. Put it on, put, hold on. Put it on Mike. Uh, funny. <laughs> yeah, but Mike, what, what, anything you'd like to leave us with? You know, I, I just think that, you know, I, on occasion, people will ask me what I, I do and I'll say, well, I'm a men's life coach. And, you know, I get these snickers sometimes and, the, and all these things. You know, I am honored. And I did a lot of research around this, uh, worked with uh, somebody in the area of calling to understand, really dive into what does calling mean in life? Because it doesn't mean right. what everybody thinks it does a lot of times. And I don't take what I do lightly because men's yeah. lives are on the line when I'm talking with them and if their lives on the line, that means their family's life is yeah. on the line. And so what I do is very serious work. Now it's not necessarily mental health work. If there's, if it's, if there's a mental health issue, we're going to get you the help that you need from a medical trained professional, right. but coach from a coaching standpoint, I take what I do very, very seriously because families are involved and you know, it's um, it's, I feel that God has entrusted me with the true man brand to do the podcast and to do the coaching and that he has given me the knowledge, skills, right. and abilities to do what I do. And uh, I do it because I want to see men be the best leaders for their families that they can. And sometimes that just means hanging out with a guy. It doesn't have to be for an entire lifetime. It could just right. be for, for weeks or a few months until you find and develop your purpose. But I wanted to say that because I think what I want men to know and what I want their significant others to know is that it's okay. It's very 
masculine to have somebody sometimes to walk alongside you in life and just help you figure out what's going on. And, and, you know, that's an honorable thing to do. And so I just want to encourage people that, you know, maybe listening or going, oh, it's another life coach. You know, not every life coach is built the same. I'm just here to tell you right now. And that is one reason why I always offer people, I wish more people would take me up on it, quite honestly, a free consultation. If you want to find out what coaching is all about, reach out to me. I'm everywhere. You want me to give me your some of the stuff, or you want to give it later? Or... Oh yeah, no, you can. If I want email, so it's going to be in the description below. But feel free to list sure. it as well, so everyone can. You, know, hear it you right can. Now. My calendar is on my website. My phone number is on my website. But you can send me an email at mike at truemanlifecoaching dot com. If you just go out to my website at truemanlifecoaching dot com, I'm a pretty open book, which should say a lot about what it is that I do, but. But, um, yeah. you know, I, I, I just want to be that guiding light for guys so that they can improve their life and be the best man that they can be. So I would just leave it with that. Yeah. And, you know, Mike, I want to thank you for your level of detail and attention to care for not only these men, but their families and that through empowering them, they yeah. can then it's a trickle down effect, you know, it, from, from him to helping out other men to helping out his family and community so thank you so much mike for coming on the show and what you do for us thanks for having me on man had a good time sailing through the ocean blue nuclear reactors my crew got in the ship the stars is our guide through the waves we ride jokes and laugh to fill the air on this voyage we have to share working together side by side as one family we will abide in the heart of the ship we reside nuclear operators with pride powering the vessel with every stride our mission the source of great pride